Thank you very much. So finally, I believe that we can begin. Once again, welcome to the conference with IFJP and ACWS. If you need the interpretation service, please go outside and bring the receivers. And if you are virtually joining us, please make sure to choose the language between English or Korean. And the chatting is also available during the discussion time, which is not very long. Please feel free to post comments or questions. And also, we are recording our conference. And if you don't want our meeting to be recorded, please let us know. And when you write down your comments, please make sure to not to get yourself. So once again, let me introduce myself again. And I am the chair of the first session. My name is Chong Ji Young. I am professor at Department of Women's Studies at Ihua Women's University. And also, I'm serving as a director of the ACWS, Asian Center for Women's Studies. It was a bit challenge for me to be the chairperson of the organizer, but also at the same time moderating the keynote sessions. But as I was preparing and organizing the ACWS conference with IFJP, I was also involved in setting the directions of this conference, so I decided to take the role. Let me introduce the order of today's conference. First of all, Professor Lisa Yuneyama from University of Toronto will give us keynote speech. Professor Luta Ziff from London School of Economic will join us as a discussant, and also Professor Karen Tomba of Harvard University will join us as a discussant. Professor Luta Ziva is actually in Korea, and she was planning to join us physically and sit, sit right next to me. But unfortunately, she got contacted COVID-19 virus, so she's staying inside hotel, and she's virtually joining us today. So after we hear the keynote speech and the discussions, and the questions will be raised to Professor Yoneyama, and Professor Yoneyama will answer those questions, and then we'll open the floor so that we can have Q&A session. Uh, and if there are any questions posted on the training window, then I will be reading those questions, and most of the Korean questions I will address. And for English question, Professor Swati Parashawa from the Swedish Gothenburg University will uh, read those questions. So we appreciate your participations by asking questions and comments. If you do, do not have enough time to discuss everything, we'll use Google Docs to take a break from the chatting and also address that. So now is the time to invite Professor Lisa Yoneyama to hear the lecture. Personally, this is the most anticipated moment of the conference for me because Professor Lisa Yoneyama is a professor at the Department of East Asian Studies and Women and Gender Institute at the University of Toronto. She is very much specialized in the memory, history, gender, militarism, violence, justice, and human rights, and studied Cold War history, colonialism, imperialism, and neocolonialism, and also transnational Asian American studies and nuclear age. So, new the status of the era of the nuclear age. So that's her specialty as well as she's doing a lot of research in that area. In 2018, Cold War ruins. It was AAAS. So she, she received a book award in the States. So it is a great honor for us to invite her. She received the 2018 Best Book Award in Humanities and Cultural Studies Association for Asian American Studies. She has sent us a recorded presentation, but before I let you hear the recorded version, I'd like to exchange brief greeting with Professor Lisa. And please let us know why you have sent us a recorded version. Yeah. It's yeah. okay? So, um, well, I, I wanted to thank you for the invitation, um, International uh, Feminist Journal of Politics and Asian Center for Women's Studies, uh, especially from New Zealand, um, Dion um, at the center uh, as director at uh, Yale University, and also um, thank you, Karen uh, and Olivia, uh, for really taking the time to read my paper uh, and um, 
uh, generously agreeing to comment. Um, so I look forward to um, uh, the discussion. Um, but what I did is, um, I don't know, because I missed um, Professor uh, Chan Jiang's introduction, um, what I did was I recorded my talk um, mainly because um, we have a severe thunderstorm morning in Toronto from um, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. And usually um, when there's a severe thunderstorm, we lose power. So um, I didn't want to have the talk part interrupted. So I went ahead and asked if it's okay to pre-record. So um, that's about 45 minutes. And um, uh, I'll come back for the, um, uh, to hear the response and also um, to my response to the responses and also um, Q&A. And I can do that even if I lose internet, um, Wi-Fi because of the power, possible power outage, I will be able to do that through um, uh, iPhone uh, using my um, uh, memory. So um, I hope you enjoy uh, the 45 minutes of my talk. And Molly, um, also? So I like to and, uh, 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 put my greetings here. Now we are going to watch the presentation recorded by Professor Yoneyama. And those of you who are joining us through Zoom, please unmute yourself so that we can be free from any disturbance during the presentation. Hello, everyone. I am grateful for this opportunity to share my current thoughts on some of the pressing issues many of my colleagues and I have been grappling with over the past couple of decades. I thank the organizers for allowing me to do so remotely and also monolingually in English. For that, I owe special thanks to the interpreters for helping me compensate for my limited linguistic ability. I am a faculty member at the University of Toronto, and I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Toronto is an institution built on the occupied land, traditionally cared for by the Huron Wendat, Haitian First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the, the Mississauga of, of the Credit River. In this paper, I hope to make a modest contribution to the conference theme by considering the possibility of coalitional solidarities in the absence of feminist universals. Critique of feminist universals or universalism underpinning certain feminist practices has increasingly gained visibility since around the turn into our new century. One of the most contentious criticisms uh, has evolved around uh, the global feminist advocacy for women's human rights regimes and its prioritizing of violence against women as the common agenda. Critics of women's human rights regimes have questioned human rights discourse efficacy in addressing the social and economic injustice affecting women. In a progrewal, following such scholars as Gayatri Spivak, Rashni, Kotari, and Aditan Ilmoka questioned the concept of human rights and argued that the notion of economic and social justice rather than the rights-based justice through law can better serve the purpose of eliminating poverty, domestic violence, and gender inequity for women in certain contexts, and moved on to reject the women's human rights regime's simplifying narratives of global sisterhood in which common ground theories can be used." Unquote. The hegemonic forms of Western feminism, according to Grewal, have been able through universalizing discourses to propose, quote, the notion of common agendas for all women globally and to mobilize such discourses through the transnational culture of an international law that can serve the interests of all women globally. Human rights discourse emerges from such notion of law, relying on international treaties and instruments to set down universalized notion of what it means to be human and what rights accompany this humanity. Another related skepticism toward the feminist international can be found in the interrogation of feminist self-mobilization into the wars and militarized maneuvers led by the powerful states of the global north. 
in the immediate aftermath of the crisis of September 11th, 2001, while the Feminist Majority Foundation supported the US-led international war machine and acted in the name of gender justice to, to save women in Afghanistan from Muslim fundamentalist abuse, some transnational feminists opposed the Bush administration's war and denounced the latter's civilizing rhetoric. In transnational feminist practices against war, uh, several transnational feminists stated their viewpoint as follows, and I quote, we critique solutions to the contemporary crisis that rely on a colonial Manichaean model whereby advanced capitalist freedom and liberty is venerated over backward extremist Islamic barbarism. Questions about the gender distribution of wealth and resources are key to our analytical approach. Many women in Afghanistan are starving and faced with violence and harm on daily basis, not only due to the Taliban regime, but due also in large part to a long history of European colonialism and conflict in the region." Unquote. It pained us indeed uh, to see that the condition they observed continues today as we witness the unfolding humanitarian crisis in the aftermath of the recent earthquake. In the following, I would like to re revisit these by now familiar aporia of the Feminist International. I will attend especially to criticisms that have regarded these aporia as a problem rooted in neoliberalism and the universalism of the post-enlightenment humanism. That modern feminist thought shares its lineage with post-enlightenment liberal humanism continues to render certain feminist practices assimilable to the colonial racial regime of knowledge that has long underpinned what we normatively uphold as political modernity and its foundational assumptions. I will retrace the intellectual and activist genealogies that have enabled the vital critique of liberal humanism, um, liberal feminism, and feminist modernity by reflecting on the intersectional critique of single axis gender analysis. The concept of intersectionality has been deployed extensively for various political ends, such that, at least in North American context, for some, the term appears to have lost its effectiveness. Yet in the long trajectories of critical feminist engagement that the concept crystallizes, we can identify a critical methodology that remains vital for questioning the universalism of liberal humanism and liberal feminism and its attendant compartmentalization of academic knowledge, as well as ultimately our efforts to strengthen coalitional possibilities without bypassing our constitutive differences, geopolitical and otherwise. In the spirit of organized commitment to center, quote, Asia as a way of disrupting hegemonic discourses by reckoning with race, racialization, and the dynamics of gender discourses that are shaped by Western and colonial influences, unquote, my paper will foreground East Asia in its Cold War and post-Cold War trans-Pacific entanglements with the United States. In March 2010, I was invited to a session at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, together with two other scholars. The session was held in honor of Beate Shibota Gordon and for the screening of a documentary film that celebrated her life. Gordon's name should be familiar to anyone who is versed in the 20th century East Asian history. Prior to w, uh, World War II, Go Gordon grew up in Tokyo as a daughter of the Jewish family, a uh, refugee family from Ukraine. Because she was fluent in Japanese, she was deployed during the post-war occupation of Japan, 1945 to 52, as an interpreter and staff member of the Supreme Commander of Allied Powers, uh, led by Douglas MacArthur. Today, Gordon is known as an American woman who participated in the drafting of the post-war Japanese constitution and who advocated for, quote, equality, the equality between the sexes um, in the Japanese constitution, unquote. According to her autobiographical account, Gordon contributed to drafting Article 24 of the constitution. <clears throat> 
<coughs> Article 24 stipulates that marriage should be based on individual choice and mutual consent, and that equality between husband and wife in marriage should be protected. Gordon was allegedly keen on ensuring Japanese women's freedom when entering marriage, because she had understood from her childhood experience that, quote, Japanese women were historically treated like chattel. They were property to be bought and sold on a whim. Um, I will pause here for a moment and um, uh, note that the Supreme Court of Japan recently ruled that the exclusion of same-sex couples from the institution of marriage is not unconstitutional on the ground that Article 24 inscribes marriage as a binary bond between the two sexes. Earlier, um, I had published a couple of articles, one in 2003 and 2005, in which I mentioned Gordon, which I believe was the reason for the invitation. After the United States had launched military operations in Afghanistan following the 9-11 events, CNN and other US media began to report on the Afghan women crowding the streets and freely visiting beauty shops without the burden of burqa. When I saw the repeated image, image images of women in Afghanistan liberated from the repressive regime as an outcome of the US military intervention, I began to wonder what it was like nearly six decades ago when the Japanese women gained constitutional rights during the Allied occupation in the aftermath of military defeat in the Asia Pacific War. I felt compelled to find out how the liberation of Japanese women were, uh, was reported to the American public. Of course, there were many historical studies on the details of post-war occupation. But when I asked my historian colleagues if they knew of any systemic analysis of how the specific dimension of the occupation of Japan was represented in the United States, no one was able to point me to any existing work. It was during this research that I learned about the resurgence of Gordon's memories in the North American public media. Gordon's biography had been circulated in Japan increasingly from mid-1990s and on, a period when the Feminist International began consolidating the notion of violence against women as a common agenda, uh, as a common women's human rights issue around the globe. Yet it was not until the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq that Gordon's authoritative account of US occupation policy regarding Japanese women gained renewed recurrence uh, gained renewed currency in the mainstream American media. In 2003, shortly after the U.S. military seizure of Baghdad, the Rocky Mountain News featured an article on Gordon entitled, Japan's Women Could Be Model in Post-War Iraq. The article read, quote, Japanese women who lived through the reconstruction of their country after World War II could help the United States rebuild Iraq and Afghanistan, says the woman who helped General Douglas MacArthur write the Japanese constitution, unquote. According to the newspaper, Gordon maintained that the Japanese women, Japanese women who had no rights prior to the new constitution are successful in politics and business today. As a colored people, Gordon reportedly, uh, reportedly noted the Japanese women could, quote, bolster U.S. credibility with Iraqis and Afghans by demonstrating that the U.S. occupation did not run their islands into a colony. I return to this story often as it remains usable to illustrate the proximity between the equal rights feminism and geopolitics, especially one involving East Asia. In my view, the turn of the new century remembering of Gordon's past accomplishment point to the limits of particular yet hegemonic constituent of feminism and needed to be problematized, at least in two ways. One, Gordon's historical invo involvement in the US-led occupation of Japan in the mid-20th mid century epitomized what can be called Cold War feminism. Variant of liberal feminism, it was instrumental at the time for the United States to assert its moral predominance in the Cold, Cold War geopolitics through its claim to gender and racial justice. It helped justify US occupation and military intervention over the formerly colonized areas that were then emerging as independent nation states. Two, 
as illustrated in our media interviews and coverage, the recuperated memories of Gordon, and especially her past role in bringing gender equality to Japan through American occupation policy, were deployed to lend leg legitimacy to America's new wars. Uh, of course, it was not only Gordon, um, somebody like George Will, who is a very famous conservative um, uh, critic, um, you know, also said a um, similar thing in a much more authoritative and straightforward way. Uh, so for instance, um, he was um, quoted to have mentioned, um, as I quote, the most important emancipator of Japanese women was General Douglas MacArthur, who made women's suffrage occupation policy, the liberators of Afghan women wore US battle dress, unquote. It may be worthwhile recalling that about six months prior to the United States led invasion of Iraq, the American public had been informed of the Bush administration's plan for post-war Iraq to be modeled on the post-war occupation of Japan. To be sure, Japan was not the only nation that was referenced for the historical analogy of Iraqi war and the occupation. The distinctiveness in invoking the memory of occupied Japan lay in its emphasis on women. Gordon emphasized on various occasions that Japanese women should be helped, uh, would be, should be held up as an exa exemplar for other women of color in Afghanistan and Iraq, since the Japanese case demonstrated that the Jap US military did not colonize, but rather brought women's right and freedom as gifts of the occupier. In other words, the memory of the successful occupation of Japan, especially with respect to the advancement of gender justice, was invoked prior to the start of the war and mobilized to sanction US wars in the 21st century and the prolonged occupation. The Japanese women's enfranchisement under the US-led allied occupation became a paradig paradigmatic frame of war that continued to shape the American notion of just war. Prevailing historical perception that the Japanese women achieved formal rights equal to their male counterpart after the military defeat, and that it was the American superior military power that brought liberation progress to Japan, not only created an economy of debt such that the US military violence received impunity in the name of progress and justice. This notion of indebtedness has furthermore helped sustain the trans-Pacific inter-imperial collusion between the US and Japan in the governance of post-colonial Asia and the Pacific region in the aftermath of World War II. A dignified and charming woman, Gordon responded to my comments at the University of London session with the following authoritative account. Quote, Japanese women had nothing, absolutely nothing, that counted as rights or power prior to the American occupation. When Gordon passed at the age 89, a few years later, one of, the, one of many obituaries published in the United States once again remembered her as an American to whom Japan remains indebted, unquote. Japanese women thus received the gift from Biati, not social and economic rights, but the right to freely choose an equal partner in the institutional marriage reserved exclusively for heterosexual couples. <coughs> So um, some of the, these preceding discussions, including the two articles on Gordon and the Trans-Pacific Entanglement of the Knowledge Production about uh, Japan and post-war US Cold War liberal governmentality in Asia Pacific region. Um, and I will talk about it a little bit more below, um, as well as the um, broader theoretical consideration of justice uh, can be found in my uh, book I published in 2016, Cold War Ruins. So if you are interested in um, more detail um, and more in-depth discussion, uh, please refer to uh, this book. <clears throat> To remember the Japanese women as powerless victims saved by Douglas MacArthur, uh, and likewise through the celebration of Gordon's accomplishment at the beginning of America's new war of the new century then, was to re-enlist re the Japanese women for the maintenance of international order under Pax Americana. If feminist majority's assimilability with the US state policy and militarism was possible because its agenda fit the latter's liberal language of equality, freedom, and individual rights, 
The attempt to marshal the Japanese women and their memories of liberation was also made possible by the liberal notion of gender justice, which was envisioned in what Kimberly Crenshaw problematized in her famous 1989 Law Journal article as single access framework. In the same article, Crenshaw forwarded the opposing concept, intersectionality. There is, of course, no need for this audience to re rehearse what these concepts stand for and how extensively and deeply they have reshaped women's uh, and gender studies in the following decades in North America and beyond. Suffice it to say, Crenshaw's intervention echoed the reach of other intellectual movements, including Black Feminine Thought and the U.S. Women of Color, Feminism, forwarded by Barbara Smith, Angela Davis, um, Audrey Lord, Patricia Hill Collins, Anzal, Gloria Anzal Dua, Sherry Moraga, Trinity Mina, and many others who clarify the simultaneous and the interlocking nature of oppression. Um, and Judith Butler and other post-structuralist feminist critique of the modern conception of subject as a unitary, autonomous, sovereign being of free will who is deemed transcendent of histories, geographies, and other social markings. Together, they set the grounds for understanding female and uh, women and female subjects, not exclusively in a bi gender binary relation vis-a-vis -vis men, but as a dense intersection of multiple social relations and historic forces that include gender, sex, race, ableism, age, religion, the state, nationalism, colonialism, militarism, etc., cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> In a critique of Habermasian ideals, of cons uh, ideals concerning the public sphere, Nancy Fraser succinctly located the problem of liberalism in its dis disavowal of difference. The liberal political sphere is premised on the normative idea that its members ought to be treated and act as if their differences should not matter, that they should be regarded universally as equal, regardless of class, descent, religious affiliation, etc. Historically, then, women, the poor, and the people of color are the latecomers to this sphere. And yet this liberal disavowal of difference and the assumption about the universal sameness and equality of the abstracted individuals have simultaneously foreclosed the possibilities of addressing the asymmetries, oppression, and disposition that originate from the actually existing historically sedimented differences. The same premise also brings into politi politics or recognition those who have previously been relegated outside the public sphere due to their class, racial, and other differences, thereby marking them forever as the belatedly included. Cultural theorists such as Dipesh Chakrabarty, Udin Mater, Mehta, Susan Buck Morse, and Lisa Lowe, among others, have illuminated the pitfalls of the European liberal political philosophy in which the universally, uh, universality of rights and freedom for some have dialectically rested on the presence of colonized and racialized others whose rights, freedom, and humanity have been negated by the same liberal values and governance. Chakrabarty, in particular, clarified how John Stuart Mill's liberal philosophy posited self-rule as the end of modern historical progress, and how such historicist argument has produced a hierarchy between those already fit to self-govern and those Indians, Africans, and other rude nations who were deemed not yet civilized enough to rule themselves, thereby relegating the latter to what he called an imaginary waiting room of history. Likewise, Lisa Lowe has identified what she calls the uh, economy of affirmative and uh, affirmation and forgetting in the Euro-American political philosophy's formalization of modern human humanism and the concept of freedom. As Lowe succinctly put, and I quote, colonial labor relations on the plantation in the Americas were the conditions of the possibility for European philosophy to think the universality of, uni universality of free human freedom. However, much freedom for colonized people was precisely foreclosed within that philosophy." Unquote. Chakrabarty's and Lowe's work furthermore suggest 
that it is also against and through the association of geography and culture that the viability of human rights practices is measured and explained. Critical, critical race theorists like Lady Volpe and others have pointed out that the violence against women that take place in the United States are hardly considered a human rights issue. They also point to the asymmetrical ways in which the international women's human, human rights regimes, while blaming religious culture for violence against Muslim women, do not similarly link the Christian far rights violation against sexual minorities and the exercise of reproductive rights to particular cultural belief and practices. It should also be noted that the assumption of the universal applicability and translatability of human rights make it possible to blame factors deemed particular to specific geohistorical and cultural locations for the failure of human rights enforcement. The universalistic assumption of human rights hold that if indeed it were applied in a truly universal manner without the encumbrance of mostly non-Western cultural impediments and mistranslation, international human rights law can do only good. The global talus of human rights then leads to yet again to the historically and geographically rooted asymmetries between universalism and particularism. As Etienne Balibar has articulated in his observation of Islamophobia in France, universalism and particularism are not mere descriptive words. They constitute ideologies that function to support the historically produced racial and colonial device by valorizing the universalistic over the particularistic, even when the former is in fact the particular masquerading as the universal. Tessa Morris, Suzuki, T. Fujitani, and others have clarified the Japanese Empire's racist and colonial ideologies around the turn of the 20th century were premised precisely on such an appeal of the universalistic civilizing mission of the post-Enlightenment historicism. Modern feminism that assumes unity and purity of gender category shares with the post-Enlightenment liberal humanism such problematic legacies of universalism and historicism. Its telos is to set free individual women as normative modern subjects through the colonial dialectics of enlightenment. In a 1984 classic essay, Chandra Mohanty succinctly dissected this problem as follows, and I quote, what is problematical then about this kind of use of women as a stable category of analysis is that it assumes an ahistorical universal unity among women based on the generalized notion of their subordination. Instead of analytically demonstrating the production of women as socioeconomic political groups within particular local context, this analytical move and the presupposition it is based on limits the definition of the female subject to gender identity, completely bypassing social class and ethnic identities, this mode of feminist analysis by homogenizing and systematizing the experiences of different groups of women erases all marginal resistance modes of experiences." Unquote. And I would add to resistant mode of experiences, um, empowering as well as domineering mode of experiences. Mohanty saw that, that the homogeneous category of women abstracted out of the web of social relations and represented universally as victim of patriarchy and male dominance leads to a uniform course of women's liberation. Once feminist emancipation is framed in such a unified and linear trajectory, it lends itself to a hierarchy among the more or less advanced women according to the unitary ladder of feminist progress. Gender universalism of liberal feminism thus leads to, a, to producing a hierarchy between those women who are already advanced into the realm of rights and freedom and those who are lagging in the dark waiting to be rescued. The idea of human rights, wrote Gayatri Spivak, quote, may carry within itself the agenda of a kind of social Darwinism. The fittest must shoulder the burden of righting the wrongs of the unfit, unquote. Similarly, in her analysis of the UN campaign against women's trafficking, Juliette Roy characterized this divide as one drawn between 
human rights and Latin subjects, and the not yet. Gray shows another scholar's critique of single access anti-discrimination framework was a vital intervention for subsequent gender and sexual studies while challenging the limits of single issue activism at large. In queer, if queer studies help complicate the straight versus gay and lesbian binary, queer of color critique coined by Rod Ferguson in his 2004 monograph, Aberrations in Black, further introduce the relational analytic with which to discern how modern capitalist society has been governed through the mutual implications of racial ordering, uh, for example, white supremacy and the Japan ideology and gender and sex sexual regulation through the concept, for example, by family values, control over reproduction, homophobia, transphobia, etc. By contrast, however, the concept of intersectionality has become a tortured one, in part because of its power to represent the real life predicaments faced by many women whose multiple interpolations and belongings cannot be easily reconciled with the category of a unitary female subject who can speak and act as, uh, as an exclusively gender subject and because of its robust transportability outside the realm of law, the word has been taken up and used in a variety of contexts. But once intersectionality became conflated with the notions of multiple identities or compounded identity of an individual subject, it became yet another buzzword for the diversity management and identity politics within the liberal institution of women's studies and its inclusionary, inclusionary multiculturalism. Such an extensive use and abuse of the concept have resulted in a situation Jennifer Nash pointedly described as struggles over the concept's ownership and authenticity, sometimes problematically leading to black feminist, quote unquote, defensiveness. It is important to remember that at least for Crenshaw, intersectionality was initially proposed as a legal concept. It was meant to overcome the law's inability to address the ways in which racism and sexism have been inseparably entangled to produce specific conditions and experiences of discrimination. In so far as it is a concept devised to address US legal practices, it, is inevitably, it inevitably rehearses the liberal languages of individualism, universalism and identity. Still, it is my contention that intersectional critique remains most promising when it is deployed, as I have tried to demonstrate that many have done, to dissect the problems of normative political modernity and its attendant universalist and liberal humanism, both of which hegemonic feminism has inherited. Though not necessarily deploying Crenshaw's legal terminology, we have seen that the Black, the black and other women of color feminist scholars, activists, queer of color critique, um, uh, queer of color critics in the United States have long interrogated the unitary concept of gender subject and exposed how feminist universalism obscures the multiple power relations that make up the very category of women. They have observed the simultaneity of oppression rooted in the entangled histories of racialized modernity and its regime of respectability. Gender oppression, in their view, cannot be addressed without simultaneously seeking transformations at other locations where these historical social forces are entangled. Such interventions, furthermore, suggested how solidarities should be envisioned. By reminding us of the multiply entangled and sometimes contradictory, contradictory ways in which power constitutes subjects, the concept of intersectionality has forced us to see that we are ontoepistemologically incommensurable. It is with this acknowledgement that we can move away from the idea of solidarity based on feminist universals and assumed gender identity, and instead seek coalitional solidarities without disavowing our incommensurable differences. <clears throat> In closing, 
I wish to return to the timely remembering of Jamaica's women's liberation at the dawn of US wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and conclude with some final reflections. Mid-century Cold War feminism regarded that gender justice can be addressed without considering intersectional relations of power. While powerful in advocating equality between the two sexes, free choice, individual spontaneity, and autonomy, it was remarkably silent on social and economic structural issues. It should be noted in this context that hypervisibility of Japanese women's enfranchisement under US-led occupation was achieved in exchange with the invisibility of the disfra disfranchisement and continued disposition of the social and political rights of men from Japan's former colonies. Moreover, the problematic Japan-Iraq analogy rests on the limited view of history that remembered only the metropolitan core of the formerly vast pre-war Japanese empire and forgets that at least in the early post-war uh, years, many areas Japan had um, many areas Japan had previously occupied remained under what Juliet Nebulon called settler militarism, for instance, in Okinawa and the Micronesia, or undergone fierce ins insurgencies against the new occupying forces and the outbreak of civil wars, um, like in Indonesia or Korea. Marginalization of Japan, uh, Japanese empires quoting so-called comfort women within the post-war post-colonial Asia and the Pacific Islands happened precisely in this dialectics of remembering and forgetting. Acquisition of formal rights and equality may have signaled liberation for Japanese women in the limited sense of procedural democracy, but it did not necessarily liberate women in other sides of power across the intersections of class, ethnicity, colonial relations, and other biopo biopolitical distinctions of race and sexuality. To remember Japanese women solely as victims of violence by militarism and patriarchy, who were empowered by MacArthur and the American occupation policy, has also contributed to an amnesia about Japanese women's active participation and collusion in colonialism and wars of aggression. We must thus ask for which women, along which fronts of power relations, and in what, in what specific respects did the US occupation bring gender justice and women's liberation? And crucially, where and who was the other woman who made it possible for Japanese women to become elevated as a liberal subject in position of free choice and equal rights? Collaborations between Professor Yun Junok and late journalist Matsui Yayori during the 1970s anti-sex tourism campaign and the comfort women redress activism since the 1990s can be noticed as an example of transnational feminist solidarity, which was forged in East Asia, but without the disavowal of critical differences. While well, their collaboration has enabled the survivors as well as their supporters to articulate and disseminate the history and the aftermath of what is today known as the wartime Japanese military sex enslavement, it was not without internal, internal differences. In the 2003 obituary essay for Matsui, Yun Junok wrote of her longtime activist partner that Matsui had understood that, quote, the Japanese military sex slavery as an outcome of the patriarchal system only, and a difficulty in grasping the Japanese military sexual slavery was not only gender discrimination, but also segregation of the Asian peoples." Unquote. In Asia, the long durée of redress activism to bring justice to the organized sexual violence against women suffered in the areas formerly occupied by the Japanese military needs to be traced back into the 1970s and prior to the um, famous Kim Hak-sen's 1991 first public testimony. At least in the initial phase, it was the colonial and socioeconomic divides rather than the universal female subordination that were among the most urgently problematized. Alice Yun Chai and others have noted that during the 1970s, Matsui, who had been inspired by the dialogues with Korean students at Ewa Women's University, has written scathing criticism of the Japanese corporate sex tourism as the layering of sexual imperialism, 
and economic imperialism, and even pointed to the wartime forced prostitution by the Japanese military. In her book, Trafficking Asian Women, Laura Kang likewise observes the multiple erasures and significant delays between the early protests during the 1970s and the international redress movement in the 1990s. Kang traces the focalization of violence against women uh, uh, against women in the 1990s global feminist governance, as well as in the US-based women's studies curricula and wars against, quote, the compulsion to represent and include Asian women under women. As part of a broader critique of what she calls the Asianization of trafficking women, Kang po uh, poses a curious question regarding why the 1970s anti-nationalism and anti-racist transnational feminist manifesto of the Inter-Asia Network, which observed the connections between the wartime forced prostitution into Japanese army and the 1970s Japanese corporate sex tourism had not been registered in the United States before 1990s. Kang concludes as follows, and I quote, marshalling the sexual exploitation of Asian women as evidence of the trans-historical and global phenomenon of female sexual slavery, precluded attention to the substantive differences and distance between Korean women and Japanese women, which were foregrounded by the 1970s anti-colonial, anti-racist transnational network of Korean church women, the Ewa students, and Matsui." End of quote. Literary critic Grace Hong has written extensively on US women of color through the analytic of queer of color critique. Closely reading the work of such writers as Toni Morrison and Isai Yamamoto, Hong argued that US women of color writers have actually um, acutely thematized um, the political difference and contributed to, the, to theorizing how the demands of racial and transnational neocolonial, cap, neocolonial capitalism thrive by reproducing, managing, and disavowing differences. In a consideration of the intensifying neoliberal violence in the United States, Hong turns to Audre Lorde's following passage to warn against the cost of inclusion into such political economic arrangements. And I quote, um, Lord writes, and this is a um, quote from Lord, um, quoted by uh, Hong. Lord writes, quote, each one of us here is a link in the connection between anti-poor legislation, gay shootings, the burning of synagogues, street harassment, attacks against women, and insurgent violence against black people, unquote. However, Hong writes, this connection requires an honest appraisal of the stakes of coalition, an appraisal of exactly what, might, what one might have to give up in order to advance the cause of social justice. Lord continues in Hong quotes, I ask myself as well as each one of you, exactly what alteration in the particular fabric of my everyday life does this connection call for? In what way do I contribute to the subjugation of any part of those who I call my people, unquote. And Hong continues, rather than define racialization as only a shared and uniform devaluation in comparison to whiteness, Lord demands that those in the audience and implicitly we as readers all take into account our own complicities with power over and against others, unquote. Neoliberalism, according to Hong, disavows racism and sexism as things of the past, while, quote, affirming certain modes of racialized, gendered, and sexualized life, particularly through invitation into reproductive respectability, so as to disavow its exacerbated production of premature death, unquote. In other words, under the neoliberal regime, the valuation of one's difference can be intimately connected to another's devaluation. Hong's rereading of Lord then calls our attention to the need to further extend and repurpose intersectional analytics to discern the ways in which differences constitutive of a subjecthood are managed and mobilized relationally. 
instead of disavowing differences as that which sets us apart, and rather than relying on putative unity and purity of gender category to build solidarity, Hong suggests that once our differences are accounted for in such critically re relationally, re relational terms as the Lord's articulation, they can be mobilized to forge a coalitional consciousness of immense reach. We can then challenge the status quo, sustained by not only simultaneous and interlocking, but multidirectional and relational system of oppression. Such a critical relational perspective, I would add, points to a different mode of caring for others. It signals a refusal to have our lives promoted and protected by the same institutional arrangements that simultaneously dispossess, exploit, exploit incarcerate, and kill others. <clears throat> Lastly, rather than faulting its practitioners and their civilizing attitudes, I propose to embrace Vivac's and others' critique of the women's human rights regimes, to reflect on ourselves, our very vulnerability as racialized feminists. I wish to consider our assimilability in the global politics of recognition and just how incessantly we are invited to be included into neoliberal humanism through real and false empowerment, regardless, indeed, of our racial, national, and geographical differences. If, as Chakrabarty put, historicism or the idea of historical process, a progress since the Enlightenment has been deeply entrenched in the formation of political modernity in non-Western societies, and if, indeed, such an idea came to new quote, came to non-European peoples in the 19th century as somebody's way of saying not yet to somebody else, unquote. Can we also likewise say that racialized feminists in and from Asia might have also learned a way to say not yet to other women in Asia and elsewhere while deploying the patronizing languages of rescue, inclusion, and the gift of women's rights. As Spivak provocatively suggested, and quote, the work of writing wrongs is shared above a class line that to some extent and unevenly cuts across race and the north-south divide, unquote. Spivak went as far as to argue that the local assistants who work as interpreters and mediators for globally operating NGOs like Doctors Without Borders are produced as post-colonial or post-colonial subjects. In a sense, we are all Spivak's colonial and post-colonial subjects of the post-Enlightenment world since the age of imperialism. Racialized feminists in Asia, too, have been and can be empowered and liberated owing to modern political idioms of rights, equality, opportunity, hence perilously mobilizable in support of the global political economic order at the expense of others' death and devaluation to borrow Hong's expression. Yet the wisdom bequeathed to us through the words of those feminists of color and queer critics who have perhaps most acutely questioned the premise of colonial modernity and its normative requirements have equally though differently empowered us. With that legacy at hand, we can continue to remake ourselves into different feminists and different women as we work together toward a more truly just world to come. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Yoneyama. So is translation provided flawlessly? Yes. When we first began this conference, there were some distractions and I even had the chance to greet the people who are joining us offline. I was so busy greeting online guests. But uh, now I would like to thank and welcome everybody who has joined us offline. So Professor Yoneyama, thank you for the presentation. And everybody has paid keen attention throughout the presentation, and I feel much more confident that this conference is going to be successful.
And yet, it is calm, but I can also feel a lot of passion, enthusiasm growing in our hearts, because that's what happened to me. We were listening to the theoretical explanation, but I was, you know, I could feel my heart jumping, and I was really emotionally excited, provoked. We are talking about feminism, the history of feminism, and the gift of the so-called gift of feminism that brought us together, all this long history behind this. We thought we knew everything about this history of feminism, but there are certain limits of feminism in explaining various historical factors. Probably we need more complicated and in-depth review to this matter. And as we have informed you before, through Asia, well, Asia is more than just a location here. Asia is a place, but it is also a not a place, because from this perspective of Asia, there are various ways through which we can shed light on this issue. And Professor Yoneyama has given us a very clear direction, an effective direction of where we should be going from now on. I don't want to take that much time as a chair of this session, but I would like to briefly point out some of the important points that I have discerned from Professor Yoneyama's presentation. Gender equality, the universalism embedded in equality is binding, is a mechanism for binding women to very specific situation. And the institution of marriage, the families have intertwined with the gender issues. And in Korea, gender issues were often treated as family issues. And people say we need to get rid of the Ministry of Gender Equality and replace it with the Ministry of Family Affairs. Women's issues are clearly and inexplicably related to economic issues of our society. Of course, it is related to family issues, but we, could not, we should not restrict women's issues to family issues. And this is related to the mechanism of universalizing women's issues. And Professor Yoneyama, you have pointed out some of the things that we thought were the issues of the past, but they have transformed themselves and emerged in each epoch of our lives, and probably in a many interesting or intriguing ways, perverted itself, changed its transformation. We often think we have gotten away from universalism, but we still see universalism still influencing our way of thinking. And some of the terminologies like intersectionality, these words that we are so familiar to can probably give us new way of thoughts. So we should never feel complacent. Intersectionality, the notion of this is related to li liberalism or multiculturalism. It could converge into multiculturalism, so we need to be on guard. And at the same time, you could say we, are sh we should sharpen the knives in the boundaries, for the boundaries of theories, and we really need to think hard about how to establish our coalitional solidarity, the direction we should pursue in establishing coalitional solidarities. So I think these are the issues that were raised by Professor Yoneyama. And that's all for my wrap up. Or I was expressing how emotionally stimulated and moved I was with Professor Yoneyama's presentation. So probably my feedback to Professor Yoneyama. Now I would like to 
invite Professor Olivier Ratazbois for comments. Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. I don't know if I was going to come next or uh, Professor Karen is going to come next. I'm, I'm open uh, to any order. Um, Karen, do you prefer to go next or should I go? Okay. <laughs> so slightly less prepared than I, <laughs> than I thought. Um, there is an echo, but I'm going to keep talking and we will see uh, what happens. I also want to join very much in the... Um, um, the thanking, um, as was mentioned, I have been looking forward so much to be physically present. I am actually physically present in, in South Korea, but um, luckily it was picked up at the airport that I tested positive for COVID. So I'm here. I hope my brain is going to be with me for the next 10 minutes. Uh, I've been listening very uh, carefully, but very grateful that I still can uh, participate in this um, conversation. Um, <clears throat> The way I've imagined this, this feedback, um, and I guess maybe that's also feminist practice, is not very much to go the very classical academic ways we have in pointing at you know, what was there, what wasn't there. What, I, I don't think those are interesting conversations. So I'm going to take it up as an invitation to prolong and um, um, contribute to this really, really important conversation that uh, Professor Lisa uh, is inviting us to. And I will specifically pick up on the invitation to think about what solidarity can look like if we um, refuse, I guess, some of the most pernicious elements of neoliberalism, but specifically also of uh, how white feminism has been deployed in continuing a project of what I think we could call global racial patriarchal capitalism, right? And I think all these elements were there um, and, and so that, that's something that I really would want to underscore and very much agree uh, with. <clears throat> and the way I think I will do it is to um, come to the conversation with some empirical examples, um, because I think also there it's quite important how we manage to think theory um, to attend to things that actually happen in the world, right? So that's for me how I see the relationship between both empirics and, and theory is that none of it exists for its own sake. Um, and I guess my, apart from having survived the long um, previous years of, of COVID lockdown by, by watching K-drama, C-drama, Taiwanese drama, like all the different ones, uh, in a way that I have felt invited into a world. And I used to log, watch a lot of TV before, but, you know, there is something to trying to think, what does it, um, what does it do when we uh, snap out of this idea that the world's can only be conceived from the West at the center of it, right? And obviously, you know, I gave, I gave um, seemingly flippant examples, which they're not actually, but it made me understand that, especially also as a decolonial scholar, there's a lot um, that we take for granted when we try and critique the colonial, again, by only speaking back to a very particular expression of it, which I would still say is quite important, but, um, the one that has uh, still Europe at its center. And so the examples I will give will actually reproduce that, but I guess the, the context in which we are having this conversation will hopefully help us to think um, what happens when we move uh, and, and shift the gaze a little bit. The first example, um, and, and it ties into why I'm so interested in uh, solidarities, and especially when solidarities break down, my own background is as a second generation Rwandan born and raised in Belgium. And, and for me, um, as also an international relations scholar, the thing that I still can't wrap my head around is um, the breakdown of solidarity um, in the context of the genocide in Rwanda, right? So specifically the UN, all the international organizations. Uh, so that's the, my background in terms of interest in solidarities. Um, more recently, what I witnessed um, after the latest iteration of Black Lives Matters um, um, movements and attention, which also seemingly was a global thing. I mean, we can unpack that. But very specifically in Belgium, what happened is that um, the political establishment discovered, rediscovered, finally acknowledged that there is a problem of racism in Belgium. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go in, in detail on how absurd that discovery is. But, you know, let's say if, if I try not to be too cynical, 
So what they did was to say, let's have a parliamentary commission, a special uh, commission, where we will go and uh, study um, what actually happened in the past when it comes to Belgian colonialism in Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi. Um, and for that, they will put together an expert panel of uh, people that would assist that parliamentary commission. Um, many reasons why that was deeply problematic. I even wrote an open letter because I found out during, um, via the media that I was on that list of experts. Um, the reason why I bring up this example uh, and the many uh, objections I had is one thing that struck me is that how we make the jump from acknowledging finally that racism exists in Belgium today to then think that we need to go back to the past only to study what had happened, even though you know most people would uh, already know that. But how, um, again, the solidarities, the potential solidarities in anti-racist activism in the Belgium of today are reproduced by establishment, right? And for me, that resonated with um, examples that you gave, Lisa, like the, the way in which we think that uh, we are fighting a colonial context um, or a patriarchal or sexist context by re-erecting divisions, but also by uh, focusing on, on specific peoples. And so in this concrete example that I gave, um, what I suggested was we have to flip it around and actually go first to the empirics and who suffers collectively in different ways from that racism in Belgium today, that would be both the new arrivals, let's say, but also specifically the Moroccan um, and other um, uh, communities. Um, everybody that is not white in a very different way, let's say, and also deeply gendered, but having a commission that then singles out three peoples as if it has nothing to do with it. For me, that was an example of where we can think of our intersectional solidarities, not necessarily as um, principles that exist in a vacuum, but that actually the understandings of power and uh, specifically, I guess, um, the way power tries to continue to move in very deeply colonial ways, that that is the thing um, that, that might help us to engage intersectionality of, or protect our intersectional insights from a redeployment in, in, in the colonial. Um, so I guess what, what um, I had another example, but I'm, I'm thinking of time as well, and I can come back to it. But the point being that, um, and, and that's something I gleaned, I guess, from immediately decolonial feminist approaches, let's say, and that's also how I came to feminism rather than, than it as a, a, a way of thinking in and of itself, is that we need to ask ourselves the question, um, the, the power question, right? And not just, is it about shifting the, the power that was not granted to certain groups to then claim it, but the follow-up question that is power to do what, right? What types of desires of power do we have? And I think that's where both feminist insight and decolonial insights can really reinforce each other uh, in that sense, that it's not just about turning the table um, or being included to finally play the game, but to deeply understand how that game was never supposed to include everyone, hence we must change the whole thing, the whole game, right? Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm thinking, um, two, two authors that, um, that helped me think that on the one hand is the concept of um, the will to, to actually choose the will to life over the will to power. And that's something that has been offered by Enrique Dussel, um, which I think is quite, quite useful way to, to think about it that can apply to many of our conversations, feminist or others. Um, and the other one, um, is questions that, you know, for instance, have been raised by people like Ilan Kapoor in development studies. Uh, what is our desire? What type of specific desire of Jewish cells do we have about power? And especially in this benign context of bringing human rights, liberating women and all of that, and great examples uh, that you offered, Lisa. Um, and I think lastly also that the ideas or how it's been formulated by Julieta Singh when she speaks about mastery, right? Like, what, what is it that, um, that we can radically think in terms of how we engage each other, but also how we read the world and also how we want to engage the world, right? That, that just having lofty ideals like human rights, it doesn't cut it because it's so easily co-opted, right? But can we speak and sit with our desires of participation or her invitation, the unlearning of mastery within that? And I think those are deeply also very 
deeply feminist, intersectional feminist um, invitations that are very much in line um, with, with your lecture, uh, Lisa, which I really, really um, um, enjoyed. And so as a very final point, I actually have no clue how long I've been talking, so feel free to stop me at any time. It's, I think, within, within that, um, trying to think about the politics of life rather than the politics of power, you know, will to life over the will to power and engaging with mastery is what can um, a conscious decision to de-westernize this exercise, what can it bring us? Um, and I think also, Elisa, you, you offered a way for us to understand that um, it's not just copy paste or universalizing move to say like, when we engage with the Asian context and obviously the Asian context, not just as a place, we see similarities, we see, but also the differences, right? And what can we learn from holding space for these two things um, at the same time? And, and I have to say, I'm not gonna end on K-drama, but there is a lot that I've understood about how racism moves by engaging that, but also very much how hierarchy is reproduced even in context of language of equality and all of that. So I will, I will end it here. I, um, again, really want to express uh, both my gratitude, but also very much, I think, a deep um, agreement with the points that have been put on the table in terms of uh, this conversation on intersectionality and how we can save it from neoliberal cooptation. And I think um, whiteness is obviously very much at the center at the, of that as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Rutan Zipois. Well, your brain has functioned superbly for more than 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Now we are going to, well, I hope you can stay awake for the remaining of our session. Now we are going to invite Professor Karen Thornburg for her discussion. Hey, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I would, as, as um, Olivia and Lisa did, I'd like to thank the organizers of Revisiting the Feminist Global, as well as the International Feminist Journal of Politics, the Asian Center for Women's Studies for bringing us together this week, online, if not uh, offline. In particular, Professor Shine Choi at Masi University, New Zealand, and Jiong Jo, Director of the Asian Center for Women's Studies in Seoul. Uh, for their tremendous contributions to the Feminist Global. And I'm really honored to participate as a respondent in this opening plenary conversation. So Professor Yonayama's brilliant keynote, Intersectionality and Humanity, Revisiting Feminist Aporia and Critical Race and Colonial Perspectives, expertly brings to the fore the urgent need uh, for coalitional solidarities in the absence of feminist universals. The story of Beata Gordon's so-called liberation of Japanese women, its contemporary resonances vis-a-vis -vis Iraq and Afghanistan, highlights the fallacy of the idea that it was and that it continues to be the American military power that brings liberation and progress to nations and women around the globe. Instead, as Professor Yonayama rightly elucidates, this story and its spinoffs reveal United States military violence as receiving impunity in the name of progress and justice. Broadening her scope even further, Professor Yonayama then shared the work of key intellectuals who, in the words of Patricia Hill Collins, clarified the interlocking nature of oppression, which led to, as Professor Yonayama notes, setting the grounds for understanding women and female subjects, not exclusively in a binary gender relation vis-a-vis -vis men, but as a dense intersection, to cite Judith Butler, of multiple social relations and historical forces that include gender, sex, race, ableism, age, religion, the state, nationalism, colonialism, militarism, the list goes on and on. Clearly liberalism's problem, as Nancy Fraser noted three decades ago, is in its disavowal of difference. This, as Professor Yonayama astutely observes, is also the problem of much modern feminism. When feminist emancipation is framed in a unified and linear trajectory, a hierarchy develops on the unitary ladder of feminist progress. To again say Professor Yonayama, gender universalism of liberal feminism thus leads to producing a hierarchy between those women who are already advanced into the realm of rights and freedom and those who are lagging in the dark waiting to be rescued. <laughs> 
This divide, as Julieta Juan des uh, describes, between human rights and acting subjects, and on the other hand, the so-called not yet. It's here where, in the words of Chicana feminist Norma Alarcon, we must disentangle the pursuit of solidarity from the politics of, uni politics of unity, where solidarity, as Fessionayama describes, is based not on feminist universals, not on assumed gender identity, but instead on incommensural differences that the concept of intersectionality, uh, intersectionality has so clearly illuminated. So what then of this idea of gender justice? In our concluding pages, Professor Yonayama offers us much to consider on this topic and provides significant inspiration going forward. Clearly, as Professor Yonayama states, gender justice cannot be addressed without considering intersecting relations of power. This means in the case of Japan, we must ask for which women along which fronts of power relations and in what specific respects did the US occupation bring gender justice and women's liberation? In addition, we must ask who made it possible for Japanese women to be elevated as liberal subjects, possessing free choice and equal rights. More broadly, following the directives of Audre Lorde and Grace Kyung Won Hong, we must think about differences relationally, including interrogating how we ourselves contribute to the subjugation of others our own complicities with power over and against others. So that, as Professor Yonayama so powerfully asserts, we refuse to have our lives promoted and protected by the same institutional arrangements that simultaneously dispossess, exploit, incarcerate, and kill others. And so, as Professor Yonayama so eloquently concluded, we can continue to remake ourselves into different feminists, different women, as we work together toward a more just world to come. And I really appreciate that idea of different feminists, different women, and working together. So building on this concluding section of Professor Yonayama's talk, I'd like to spend the last few minutes of my time today thinking about gender justice and the contributions of Asian and Asian um, diaspora literatures, other cultural products toward creating this more just world. This, in fact, is the topic of my recently completed book, Gender Justice in Contemporary Asian and Asian Diaspora Literatures, which hopefully will be out next year. I begin the introduction of my book with a brief discussion of Indian Dalit feminist writer Urmila Pawar's Marathi language short story, Justice. The village elders in this short story, Justice, are, hor are horrified that a young widow of five years named Paru is four months pregnant. They command Paru to reveal the identity of the child's father, and they reject her claim that she doesn't know who the father is. Undeterred by their arrogance, Paru assertively declares, sexual violence, Balatkar, was committed against me. I am telling the truth. All of you people listen and give me justice. After demanding justice for herself, Paru reveals that she was raped when walking alone to the market to sell produce. When she then rejects a villager's claim that, quote, on no account can we let that bastard child live, the narrator declares everyone was united in seeing so-called justice carried out against her, but Padu had taken justice into her own hands. So ideas of justice clearly are reconfigured in Power's short story, Justice. The punishment called justice that women face when they're suspected to have erred which Power describes in a 1998 interview as the foundation of the story justice. This idea of justice instead becomes a rejection of punishment. Yet the reconfiguration of justice that takes place in the story justice is only partial. It doesn't address other systemic gender inequities, much less the gender-based violence which Paro is likely to continue to face given the absence of structural changes that would reduce her vulnerability. She shares that no one in the village will support her as she ages, that there's nothing preventing her brother from again beating her. Moreover, she remains an impoverished farmer who must travel alone across great distances to sell her produce in a society where there's little deterrence for rape. To be sure, justice is often discussed in the abstract or as a matter of law, political history, protest movements, enfranchisement, and similar phenomena. Yet at its core, justice involves individuals and their experiences, experiences most directly accessed in many cases through stories. 
Moreover, as Jacqueline Rose contends, literature shares experiences of violence in ways that defy both discourses of politicians and defenses of thought. Literature and other narratives, Rose continues, takes us deep into parts of the world, crying out unambiguously for justice. For centuries, literature and other cultural product, uh, products globally, uh, from fiction and poetry, memoir, creative nonfiction, all kinds of, of writing and creative production, they've broken silences, highlighting the ubiquity and brutality of gender inequity and gender-based violence and exposing the devastating physical, psychological, social, and economic impacts. Stories play a vital role in efforts to reduce and ultimately eradicate the inequities and the violence that so pervade our societies. They vividly depict the intensity of individual and collective suffering and underscore the need to recognize and overhaul all forms of gender injustice and other forms of injustice as well. Literature's frequent focus on agency, resistance and resilience among broader historical, cultural, social, economic, and familial dynamics has uniquely enabled it to be one of the loudest and most persistent voices in revealing the urgency of and the possibilities for change. Needless to say, conversations on gender justice are especially timely given the disproportionate burdens of care and economic impacts on women during the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to the increasing violence against women in Asia and globally, the shadow pandemic, according to UN Women. The pandemic's full impact on gender justice in Asia and around the world won't be known until later in the 2020s at the earliest. But Joni Sager's 2018 observations are even more pertinent today. Gains in women's empowerment, she says, are fragile, reversible, and always under pressure. A remarkable number of governments, she continues, seem committed to turning back advances in women's autonomy. We've seen that, of course, very recently in the United States. While remaining informed about current and ever-evolving crises and the implications for what lies ahead, we cannot fully comprehend either the present or the future without grappling with the past, exactly as Professor Yonayama has described. Literatures from East, South, and Southeast Asia, their diasporas, provide particularly important lenses into gender inequity and gender-based violence across time, lenses without which gender justice will remain an even more elusive goal. So if justice is a condition of right arrangement, the condition of rightness for each and all, then gender justice involves eliminating biased gender norms, renouncing all forms of inequity and violence, holding perpetrators accountable, and enabling every individual to have autonomy over their bodies and their lives, living equitably and free from oppression. My language here comes uh, both from Douglas Mao's Inventions of Nemesis, Utopia, Indignation and Justice, as well as materials from the Third Wave Fund. Given that global injustice is, quote, shot through with gendered inequality, to cite Williams and Death and their work on global gender justice, uh, gender, because, because global injustice is shot through with gender inequality, gender justice is becoming an increasingly significant component of discussions on global justice. Notable in this context, again, is the work of feminist philosopher Alison Yeager, whose prologue to a theory of global gender justice recognizes large-scale gender disparities as both elements and manifestations of transnational cycles of gendered vulnerability. This understanding, Yeager acknowledges, discourages the idea that any simple strategy for global gender justice exists. At the same time, its assertions that patterns of gender disparity are neither coincidental nor inevitable, and that cycles of gendered vulnerability are created by human institutions and so are open to human intervention, leave space for creating different worlds. I once again want to thank uh, Lisa and Olivia for opening these vital conversations and providing us with such crucial perspectives. And I very much look forward to our discussions these next few days, which are certain to provide context and depth to our research and teaching for many years to come. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Professor Karen Thomberg. Now we are running behind our time, so we would like to give the floor to Professor Yoneyama for her comments. Hey, thank you. Um, thank you so much, um, both Olivia and Karen, 
for such engaged readings and conscientious response. I really um, appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, I um, don't have a sort of visual comments, um, and, um, but I was very inspired by the two names um, that Olivia mentioned, um, Amy Kedisel, whose work I didn't know, uh, and Juliette um, new book. I, I quickly checked up and I haven't, I haven't finished, but I started reading. And um, I, in my, um, my, the book that I um, mentioned, um, I sort of really dealt with uh, um, Derrida's notion of justice. And, he, you know, he takes webinars and sort of thinks of justice as, um, um, you know, uh, absolutely clarity that um, can not be assimilable to the existing institutional language or this worldliness. Um, and I, I just started reading uh, this now, but it, it, it sounds like there are a lot of um, um, shared conversations between the two. So I really wanted to go back and uh, really uh, think through the idea of justice and also um, you know, learn more from um, this particular location. Um, you know, so, so that in the um, North American context, decolonial, um, you know, the term has um, it came from Walter Mignolo, also from Latin America, and very much, um, you know, trying to um, just, uh, you know, uh, saying that, you know, colonialism really didn't start with the British, uh, but really much further, uh, you know, and, and that the term decolonial quickly got taken up um, and really became an important word for the indigenous um, uh, activism and intellectual engagement. So, um, and thank you for that. Um, you want to read more. And um, Julieta Singh's work, I started reading, I haven't finished, but um, I thought this, um, you know, all these uh, aporia that we're dealing with, so humanitarian turning into yet another imperialism, um, you know, the lib uh, liberal and neoliberal uh, biopolitics uh, turning into more death than evaluation in Bert Scholl's work. Um, so, and all these are probably sort of um, kind of I, the way, so, so far as I read, um, you know, sort of uh, reconfigured and re sort of um, presented to us through the um, deconstruction value of mastery. So I, you know, I would, it really inspired me. You know, we really wanted to learn more. I, I just remembered um, in, a, in a very feminist group, a bunch of women of color um, a group <laughs> of people who were uh, you know, commenting on my book. They were, they were you know, kindly referring to my book as masculine book. <laughs> and, you know, the, uh, the other audience, actually, one of the people who was in the audience would stop using words with masculine that just kind of reminded me. And, but this book seems like it's really a kind of systematic sustained critique of that, um, or the notion of mastery, whatever, however it's defined, um, you know, it's something that we really need to grapple with. It's something that's kind of, you know, it's in, in, it has formed us as an academic, uh, you know, people who are trained in education, um, you know, through this kind of knowledge accumulation. So thank you for that. Um, uh, for Karen, um, I was um, struck by the Dalit's feminist work of ours, uh, uh, and you mentioned in there that um, you know this is a uh, this is a one uh, raising is justice considered without punishment. It's a, it's a work of justice pointing to the idea of justice without punishment, and I think this is. Um, related to um, um, to me, it, I haven't read the work, but how, the way you present it, um, sort of pointed to the ways in which the you know, um, critique of carceral uh, and you know people who are uh, abolitionists are really sort of um, uh, seeking the notion of justice without punishment. Um, you know, so uh, women who vulnerable, um, you know, going to the police uh, and you know, going to the police actually um, and making them punished, be punished is, is actually really not helping us. 
um, you know, that kind of relational way of understanding. And I just, I just made me think that this new thing uh, in this story might be pointed to uh, or resonate with the kind of critique of carceral capitalism. Um, and, and I also very much appreciated that you um, highlighted the um, Jacqueline uh, Rose uh, point about the importance of literature. Uh, and that too, I think, is, um, you know, um, related to this notion of this in the way that literature or imaginary space um, is where we can sort of um, have a glimpse of, of justice that isn't beyond judicialization, uh, beyond um, is something that's not, um, you know, uh, looking toward some progress and accomplishment and triumph. So uh, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I do want to say one thing, though, uh, because I spent so much time in my talk uh, about this, uh, about um, the notion of gender. And, uh, you know, as much as I appreciate um, you were bringing up this, uh, you know, important justice in the COVID situation, um, oh, I should speak closer to, uh, I'm sorry. Wait, have you been able to hear me? Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so the COVID situation um, placed disproportionate burden on women. Yes, but then I think we also need to ask which women. So, you know, essential workers, um, gig workers, single mothers, um, they are very different. Um, Full-time worker, but temporary hire employees, um, you know, um, their vision is really very different from, um, you know, women protected by um, you know, family, um, you know, extended family uh, who have, uh, you know, husband support um, or, you know, um, protected by large corporations and can work remotely. So I think um, um, the kind of, um, again, blanketing of a gender, proportionate uh, burden on gender. Um, I think I, I would like to uh, flag that a bit. Um, you know, so, um, you know, in Toronto, uh, there was, um, you know, to be, there was people in the day, um, you know, that to find out where the, um, if we can find the most positive cases, you don't really need COVID mapping. You just need to look at zip code because it's the uh, you know segregation of the um, class and residence, um, and then that segregation matches exactly the COVID mapping. You know the high concentration of COVID cases is exactly that zip code. Okay? So you know it is it's really um, race and class um, that really needs to be taken in, into account. Um, so. In a way, you know, um, new ban on uh, ban on uh, abortion <laughs> happening in the US, um, which again is not so much talked about in terms of human rights. Uh, um, even CNN, you know, uh, immediately talked about how this new uh, Supreme Court decision is affecting the poor and women of um, color. You know, so I think this intersectionality is really um, has we shape your understanding of gender justice uh, as well. So I, I just wanted to um, kind of flag that because I spent so much time thinking about this in my talk. Yeah, I, I think I'll just stop here. Thank you. Yeah. Can, can I, you I would like to thank Olivia, Karen, Lisa for their wonderful comments and presentations. And through such discussion, I think we should see power as something precarious because power always has ironies and full of paradoxes. So we need to look at power in a different perspective and analysis of power. Through analysis of power, we should be able to identify new ways of establishing coalition and equity, equality, and as Karen Thumber has mentioned about justice, they might sound very sweet, 
to us. But these words could already have been polluted or contaminated because there is not a single word that we can use without any review or editing. So we really have to give hard think hard think hard about how these words have been misused by existing power structure. I'm not sure if this is the right expression, but we need to get away from that and try to look for other ways of using these words. I think it should be appropriated. They are being appropriated at individual level, so we need to think about new ways of using these words. Because these concepts are still valid. It's something we cannot abandon. But we have to find the right place to use them. So challenge to us, we need to throw away something and set up new things, compromise and create some things. And in this thought process, I think this is going to be both based on thinking and action. And this is where we can find the goal of such academic conversations like this one. And now we don't have much time, but we're going to open the floor to the audience. I would like to ask people in the audience to participate in this discussion. So if you have any thoughts or comments, please feel free to share them with us. And Professor Shain Che wanted, said that he, she wants to do this in a casual manner. In, I'm not sure if I'm doing a good job of that. So please relax. And because we are running out of time, please make your comment in one or two minutes, preferably. So any comments from the floor? This is a very precious time so, and also a precious opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Lisa Prugel. I'm so pleased to be here, and thank you so much for this fantastic panel. I was looking forward to it. I saw that you're so crucial to so much of what feminism has been about, and I, I hear you all use uh, terms such as equality, justice, um, you know, uh, vi well, violence less so, but but really liberal concept, centrally uh, liberal concept. Uh, rights, right, is, is that other concept. Um, and what I'm puzzling about is, um, I, and it's actually a question, I mean, uh, spe specifically to Lisa, um, because you seem to associate rights with universalism. Uh, my question is, are rights always universal and can we reconceptualize rights so that uh, intersectionality applies? And how would you think about that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I think it's when I move around, um, my sound gets um, cut off. So I'll be still. Um, thank you for the question. And um, I didn't mean to imply um, rights or the notion of rights um, is always universalistic, but the, the ways in which the idea of um, human rights is used in an international regime, um, regime of uh, women's human rights, I think that is, that is universal. Um, so I, I want to make that clear. Um, so in this, the idea of women's rights in the uh, global feminist use of uh, women's human rights um, in terms of regime and international regime um, is, um, is different from sort of when we say inalienable right of, of an individual. Um, so, uh, so that's what um, I want to clarify. Is that, does that make sense? Yes, this term, rights, the notion of rights can be used in different manners, depending on who and how and when it is used. And Professor Yuneyama has pointed out that rights are sometimes seen as something naturally given to us in universal context. 
I, am I right to interpret it that way? Professor Yoneyama, did I understand it right? So rights or depending on who and when and how it is used and how it is accepted can be interpreted in totally different manners. So we need to be on guard about this all the time. We need to be on our toes. Any other questions from the audience? Thank you, Jian. That's that's great. And I also want to add that that you know every knowledge is situated. So and that's the I think one of the one one of the wisdom of feminist thoughts. So thank you. This is a very classic idea, situation. And from that, we can apply this in many ways. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lisa, for that um, fascinating uh, presentation. I really liked um, that when you mentioned about the analysis of intersectionality, that um, my name is Beatrice, and I'm a PhD candidate from Griffith University in Australia. And um, I'm actually doing my PhD, and I'm using intersectionality as uh, my approach. So uh, when you say that we should seek um, combined solidarity without compromising our different identities. So my, actually, my question is going to um, Olivia. Um, you mentioned that um, we should think about the politics of life than the politics of power. Um, Maybe if you could uh, shed some, some light on that, on what you meant, because um, politics of power is the one that is actually continuing to cause the vulnerability on, on, uh, on women. So I really um, would appreciate if you could give some light in what should uh, the polit why should we ignore about the politics of power and only concentrate on the politics of life? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I wish I could see you, but I'll pretend I did. <laughs> um, yes, I, um, I'll try to answer the question in how maybe we see that um, intersectionality is being co-opted, but also very much um, used in, in everyday activism, right? And, and again, if I think of the context of, you know, what we could very old school, like call multicultural, you know, Western Europe today, um, we are offered to see fights between different peoples of colors as if we are what some people call in misery Olympics, right? So when it's about um, a room with different people, the black women would understand uh, oppression even more than others or you know so so this this competition that is being created i think that's the first example of where we can think of um attention to intersectionality as you know if you know the game musical musical chair right where somehow we are fighting to finally be able to participate in the game and the way we try to to win that fight is to identify our particular qualities that make us either uh, more insightful or having more rights or having something more, right? And the thing is that I don't think I necessarily want to deny that there is truth to that, to some of these uh, uh, aspects. So a concrete example, if we are talking about the, the veil, the wear of the veil and how the different states in Europe, again, try to organize how women should dress or not dress, in that context, given that I'm not um, a Muslim woman wearing or not wearing the veil, I feel that I, I will participate in that conversation, but mostly, first of all, as, as a listener, like from a particular positionality, right? Or um, in situatedness. So in that sense, I can acknowledge that there is things that we know and have access to that others don't, but it's not a competition because at the end of the day, the reason why I would feel compelled to participate in that conversation is not necessarily as expert or as master of it, but I think that our um, uh, possibility of survival of this game that was rigged to begin with, so again, the musical chair, um, is, is also interlocked, right? So when then I bring up uh, Enrique Bissell's idea of um, 
the anti-colonial or the decolonial being, um, and I include decolonial feminism in that, obviously, um, about a commitment to the will to life over the will to power. That does not mean that we are averse or against power, but that the will to power is being, is being secondary or subject or deployed for the will to life. And I think for me personally, and it, it's still quite abstract, and I, it's not that I know that much about it, but it just resonated so much in a way that we can really um, solve or protect those ideas that we have, whether it's the decolonial that's also being co-opted or intersectionality or feminism, you know, feminisms, all these things that, that we can see that neoliberalism tries to engage with to keep everything the same, being able to adjudicate or make a distinction between what is the power for and actually forcing ourselves to answer that question rather than simply stopping at trying to gain that power. I think that's, that's what I find useful. And life, I think, is, is, is the one thing we talk about universals, but you know, and, and that obviously goes beyond the human even. But I think that's, that's an abstract enough uh, goal that, that that can under, underscribe a lot of, of our desires for solidarity. So that that that's you know a bit vaguely maybe what I would answer to this. But so it's not against power, but it's about being explicit that um, we have to justify what we want to use it for. And the proposition would be a will to life, preservation of life, life and dignity. I would add to that, but um, can 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 be one of the different ways in which we can engage this. Thank you so much for your question, and good luck with the PhD. Thank you very much, Professor Ruta Zibwa. Dichotomic view of power and will to life. Well, we don't have to choose one between the two. But the emphasis on will to life, we can think about how the power can have an impact on our will to life because that is related, these two are related. And I think that's what Professor Ruta Zibwa was saying. But the survival, how should we see this issue of survival should be a w area that we need to think about. I think you would love to see our audience, right? So can our technical team turn the camera towards the audience because I don't think they need to watch any more of myself. So this is the offline audience. This is how the atmosphere of the room is like. So we can say hi to each other. We have three minutes remaining. So if is there anyone who would like to ask the last question to the panelists? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for our speakers. Uh, fantastic start to a conversation. I hope you can hear me, yes? Okay. So a uh, fantastic start to a conversation, I guess, um, on feminism and sort of power and politics. And I found it fascinating that we basically went back to power, right? Whenever you start to learn about politics, the first lecture or international relations, the first lecture is usually about power. So we have really gone back to the basics. But I was wondering, um, also based on, our, on you know, how you introduced yourselves um, at the start of your conversation was very personal also. So everyone was you know, mentioning, I don't know, about economics and feminism, about Rwanda, um, about you know, making a journey across different um, continents to get to your research. And I was just wondering for the people who are in this room, perhaps, they are still working towards a PhD or you know, developing their um, research agenda, whether you would have any tips on how to, I don't know, um, follow those um, personal, uh, how, to, how to invest in those personal uh, motivations that they had, that they perhaps started out their journey on. If you have any tips towards that, that might be an interesting way to conclude. Thank you. Anyone? would like to inspire us some motivational stories. I think we can spend four days straight talking about this, but we don't have that time. So anyone would like to take the mantle? So Professor Yoneyama, could you wrap up, like give us some motivation and give us the momentum to continue with this journey of research? What has brought you so far? <laughs> 
Um, I, you know, I'm really not, I, I'm not really a, a model person, model scholar. I'm, I'm very peculiar. Um, but what made me continue or pursue my research is actually resentment, resentment or anger. Um, you know, I, I think that really motivates me. Um, I guess you could say mondaishiki um, in Japanese or kind of problematics, but you know, it's really for me, it's really, I'm just upset at something and I just can't stand it. I just can't understand why a person thinks this way, why things are this way. It just sustain me to my age. My, yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I'm sure there are better models than this. Thank you very much, Professor Yoneyama. That sense of anger is something that cuts across all feminists. And that's the thing that we all have common with other feminists. And everybody who's in this room probably experienced that kind of anger throughout their life. And that has sustained us so far. And I think everybody has given us their laughter, and I think that's a signal of our sharing of that kind of emotion. And we need to wrap up now. In the chatting room, uh, oh, Mr. Abuja, Ms. Amuja has shared some sense of empathy, and we did not see as many questions as we expected, but I believe there was a lot of questions. And to Swati, Miss Swati, would you like to share some greetings? Swati? Professor Swati, I think he somehow, Professor is not joining, but during the last session, the closing session, Professor will be chairing the session. So we are full of anger now, and there are so many things that we would like to share, but we need to wrap up because time is up. So as for the questions that were shared in the first session, I think they are enough to sustain us for the next two, three days and it will continuously stimulate and provoke us, and we will have more discussions about some of the questions, dealing with more sensitive and productive analysis. In that regard, I would like to thank Professor Lisa Yoneyama, Professor Olivier Yutazbois, Professor Karen Thornburg, Thank you very much for your participation, everybody in the audience as well. Let us give us uh, ourselves a big round of applause.